and welcome to episode 2 in my how-to series. Following on from episode 1, where we made our cold cure silicon moulds, in this episode I'll show you how to cast. We'll be using the same moulds we made in episode 1, which are now cut and vented. These moulds are for a 1 to 48 scale figure, and parts for my 1 24 scale mouse tank. We need to get the moulds up to operating temperature, as cold moulds cool the metal before it can flow into all the detail in the mould. I normally preheat the moulds to 125 degrees centigrade, or 250 Fahrenheit. The mould won't give off any fumes, and we'll be casting at over 280 degrees centigrade, so they'll be fine. To begin casting, we'll need a few things. Some talc, some rubber bands, a paintbrush, some long-nosed pliers, some tin snips, some boards cut to the size of the moulds, a lighter, some metal, and a melting pot. I have a large electric melting pot, but smaller ones are available. There are links to suppliers in the description. Now, about the metal. We will be casting in pewter, also known as white metal. When molten it behaves like mercury, being very fluid, but cools to a solid within a few minutes. It goes from being very shiny to a dull finish, often crystalline as it solidifies. You should be aware that even though it is solid, it's still hot and can burn. I usually cast larger parts at about 280 degrees, with finer parts that require more flow being cast at 300 degrees. You can get a rough idea of the temperature of the metal by its colour. Basically, silver is good. Yellow is starting to get too hot at about 310 degrees, and purple is way too hot at 320 degrees plus. You should always be casting somewhere well ventilated, and where you don't mind spilt metal burning holes in things. Accidents can happen. Kitchen worktops and carpets do burn. I'm using a sheet of chipboard, but even that has blisters from spilt metal. Pewter is a mixture of tin and lead, often with other metals added to give it properties for specific applications. The tin gives the metal its strength, while the lead helps the pewter flow and cast while molten. Bulky castings will take longer to cool, and fine parts will cool quickly. You can see that after 4 or 5 minutes, the pewter is solid enough to pick up with pliers and put back into the pot for casting. Now that our moulds have heated up, let's do some casting. The hot moulds are first given a dusting of talc, and then placed between two pieces of hardboard. You could use plywood, or any non-flammable rigid board. Elastic bands are then wrapped around the mould to hold it tight together, without distorting the shape of the mould. It's important to work quickly, but carefully, as we need to maintain the mould temperature between castings. You can now fill the mould with metal. Once the metal is solidified, we can open the mould and take out the castings. If you're interrupted, or unable to keep the mould temperature up, put it back in the oven until you're ready. Castings seldom come out perfect first time. Rejects can just be put back in the pot and melted down. Often after a third attempt, you should have a good idea how the mould is behaving. You may need to heat a small area of the mould directly, to get the part to cast. For this, I use a lighter. You may even need to open up the feed, to let more metal in, or you may need to cut and drill more air vents. Try and inspect the castings as you go. There's nothing worse than finishing a casting session, only to discover that all your castings are missing some crucial detail. And here are our castings, with the feeds and air vents still attached. These can be cut off with the tin snips. The surface finish is quite good, and these parts shouldn't take long to clean up. You should now have some idea of how the metal behaves, and some of the factors that can affect the quality of the castings. Mould temperature, metal temperature, head of metal, air vents, feed size, clamping pressure, 
are all things that you can vary to help your parts cast. Now, let's see what happens when things go wrong. I cut this mould with an air vent going out the side, rather than the top of the mould. I'm going to cast it without enough rubber bands holding it together. As I pour the metal in, it escapes up the air vent, melting and breaking the elastic bands. You can guess what happens next. The moulds we've made and cast from are fairly small, but we can cast larger parts. To do this, we need to upscale the operation. I use a vise to hold the mould, and use plywood boards held together with G-clamps. This mould is for a 1-48 scale Messerschmitt BF109 wing. As such, it needs a fair bit of metal, and takes quite a while to cool enough to be demoulded. It's still very hot to handle at this stage. I use leather gloves, pliers and cutters to separate the wing from the feed, and I'll have to leave it for another 5 minutes before I can safely handle it. The fuselage mould is a similar story. In this case I'm further preheating the mould by pouring molten pewter directly onto it. This tall mould is designed and built on exactly the same principles as the small moulds we made in episode 1. The bulky feed is the last part to solidify, and can often be soft when you demould the casting. Larger moulds mean bigger feeds and vents, which can often take quite a bit of effort to remove. But when everything goes right, this is the quality of casting you can get from a large mould. Problems such as flash are common, and caused by insufficient pressure holding the moulds together. You should be aware that as the rubber bands warm up, they soften and lose tension. This is something you'll have to allow for. Pock marking in the surface like this is often caused by air bubbles, or moisture in the mould. This was my first pour with this mould. The second pour was perfect. The fuselage has a lot of porosity around the nose, where the master is bulky. This is the hottest area of the casting, with all the metal flowing through here. As the metal cools, it shrinks, leaving rough voids in the surface. It can be filed out and filled, but any detail is lost in areas like this. Finally, this is what you can achieve from these rough castings. These are finished masters for the 1-48 scale BF109E. All the filing and scribing has been by hand, and other details have been added with milliput. These metal masters will now be used to make vulcanised rubber production moulds, but that's for another episode. I hope you found this episode of my how-to series interesting. If you did, hit the like button, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, to see the next episode of my how-to series, and follow other projects I'm working on. If you have any questions about issues raised in this series, just leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching.